All right, we're live, and today we're going to talk about the 72nd work week. What do we mean by that? You've probably read Tim Ferriss's book, The Four Hour Work Week, but today we're going to talk about the 72nd work week with my special guest, Matt Clark. Um, you're going to love it. He's got a really unique background that he brings to the table to share some insights from. I'll let him share more about that when we get started. This is the Not Your Average Joe show, and we have a Not Your Average Joe on today with us. I'll be right back. This is the Not Your Average Joe show, where each week we bring you sales, marketing, and mindset strategies you need to get to your next level. And now, here's your host, international business mentor, Joe Soto. Hey, Matt, welcome to the show. Man, what a great intro, man. You know, I spent some time doing Fox Sports 1 TV, and it's all about the glitz and glamour. What a way to welcome a guest to the show. Thanks for having me on, Joe. Man, you're a rock star. I'm really glad you're here. Thanks for being with me. My pleasure. Well, you have a unique background. Um, you know, I know now you're, you've are you pivoted. You're helping organizations. You're helping entrepreneurs. You're helping uh, company executives. Uh, with high performance, building high performance teams, building a high performance culture built around a framework that you garnered from your experience as a NASCAR uh, pit crew coach, right? Am I saying that right? You are saying and, it right. Yeah. And that is such a unique background to then now pivot to what you're doing now. Let's talk a little bit about, um, before we get into the 72nd work week, Give everybody a little bit of background on, you know, on you so you can kind of introduce yourself better than what I could. And then I've got some questions for you directly that can relate to this audience. And I know that you're going to give a tremendous amount of value here. So first, welcome. What's a little bit of background? Thanks, Joe. So I am a pit crew coach and I get asked all the time for folks who are not familiar with NASCAR. What is a pit crew coach? <laughs> and, and bottom line, Joe, it's this. You have football coaches, baseball coaches. And I was a college baseball coach, played college baseball, been coaching athletes wow. my entire life. That pivoted me to NASCAR and became a pit crew coach. And basically a pit crew coach is the X's and O's coach for the guys that go over the wall, put the tires on, fuel the car. And that's how I built my high performance professional coaching as a pit crew coach. Awesome. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, I said at the beginning that a lot of people have heard of Tim Ferriss's book, The Four Hour Work Week. And um, we've titled this the 72nd or the 70, yeah, se uh, 70 seconds, right? Yep, 70 second work week. Yeah. Let's talk about where, where you come up with that and what that means and how people can apply that because it's really a mindset. It is. So if we look at building a pit crews. And I had the, the pleasure of building pit crews for drivers like Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson, high performers, championship winners, et cetera. So for me, it is about when we look at the 77, the 70 second work week, it culminates in this. Our guys do five to seven pit stops a week. Yeah. Typically 11, 12 seconds, 10, 11, 12 seconds. That is the work that they're judged on every week. <laughs> That's their evaluation. Just That's their evaluation. Time. So basically, uh, you know, a minute, a minute and a half worth of work. And you're going to know if you're going to have a job come Monday morning after the Sunday race. And there have been plenty of times that I have flown home on a Sunday night from a track somewhere in the nation, knowing that someone's not going to have a well-paying job in the morning because they didn't execute during that 70, 80, 90 seconds during the day. It's tight. Margins are super tight, tenths of a second. And that's what folks are judged on. And that's where my experience in high performance overlays into the business world because of that high performance mindset and really getting stuff done in that short amount of time. Yeah, I love it. I, I you know, most people, they think about all the work that they had to do in a day those guys have to worry about the, all the work they've got to do in that 70 seconds to perform at an optimal level uh, and, and produce. And that's what they're evaluated on. 100%. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is great. So you, you've built championship pit crews for people like you just mentioned, Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson, um, and, and others. What's the parallel for everyday entrepreneurs, people 
that are trying to build their businesses from people that you've coached in high performance situations in a much different context. What is it that you're bringing now to entrepreneurs and, and, and business owners that can help them move the needle? Okay, there's a lot here, but let me unpack, first of all, the three pillars of a high performance team, right? Mindset, yeah. you hit on that. Yeah. Building culture, measuring execution. But the parallel is tight margin, processes, systems, preparation, personnel, recruiting. Like I was constantly recruiting 24-7, almost 365, trying to get the best talent for the best drivers in the world. So all of those things come together when you look at it and say, wow, there are a lot of parallels between building, running, and racing a pit crew and building my business. And as a small business coach, I work with business owners, entrepreneurs. There are so many parallels every day that we come up against and say, oh yeah, we did this in racing. We do this in business. Well, let's give me, give me an example because I think a lot of people get tied up in, you know, with they might be starting their work day off and all of a sudden maybe they've even planned their day, but the phone rings, social media alerts them, their Facebook messenger goes off their WhatsApp, whatever it is that's distracting them. What do you tell people? What do you give them? What's a golden nugget for people to focus and to hone in on what they could be most productive with during the day? So again, I, I like to start my day. Obviously, we all have our list and getting three things done, but time blocking is big. And then really shutting off notifications, making sure that people can't get a hold of you because we are constantly connected. And I'll be yeah. honest with you, like I struggle with that sometimes myself, where I'll do a total social media fast. And I'm like, I am a different person when I'm disconnected from my phone. But just like the pit crew, right? We have long periods of green flag racing, they're sitting waiting for the car to come in, all of a sudden caution flag comes out, they've got to do 12 seconds of work so the focus has to be there. And I think when you look at it, the end goal is what? Is winning. So yeah. if we keep in mind that we want to win, we have to say what's important? Scrolling on social media or actually digging in, clearing my mind, and we know it takes anywhere from 10, 15, 20 minutes to actually get our minds back right to work on a project and then dig in and push. I'll tell you what, I, I read uh, a book on hyper-focus. That was huge. Uh, a book on deep work. Yeah, Cal Newport's book. Cal Newport's yeah. book was like a game changer because it's like this guy is just spending hours in the zone. And that's what I try to do is try to get in the zone to get max flow max amount of the time that I invested. Yeah. I mean, you hit on execution being the third part of your framework. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think that a lot of people can get caught up in planning. They can get a, caught up a lot in what they think they have to get done and do maybe even get caught up in thinking of what they would maybe delegate, but they don't actually ever execute. I think there's self-sabotage that gets in the way of execution. And execution, I know it's the third part of your framework. Let's dive into it a little bit. Give us some insights into what people could get from you in terms of execution tips. Like what are some strategies to get things done? Well, I say it this way, that mindset is the personal horsepower. Okay. Culture is the company's horsepower. Execution uh -huh. is the fuel for success that fuels it all. Because we can do all those other things, have a great mind, have great culture. But if we're not executing, yeah. How are we know that we are winning? So what we have to do is what needs to be measured. What gets measured gets improved, right? So yeah. we get caught up in being very general. I can tell you this. As a pit crew coach, we had 22 to 25 different time segments that we measured per pit stop. Wow. How many <clears throat> tenths of a second to take off the tire? How many steps around the car? How quick did the jack man get around the car? And we would break those things down. And then we knew benchmarks. What is the industry doing? What can we do to improve what's happening with our guys? So people knew on the board, were they winning, were they losing? And I think we're afraid sometimes to actually have very visible uh, KPIs and metrics. But in our world, like we live and die by the stopwatch. That's how we tell if we're winning or not. So I think there has to be this, this mindset change, right? We start with mindset. That's why it's important that we have to measure so we can say what needs improved and then help people get better at what they're doing. Uh, so <clears throat> you touched, touched on, I recently read a book and I, the author's escaping me and it was called uh, measure what matters. 
uh, man, it's, the, name, the authors escape me, which isn't is which is rare. But I know P Peter Drucker also wrote "What Gets Measured Gets Improved." Correct. And you just talked about how we do that. But give give a let's say we've got entrepreneurs that are listening right now who go, I don't even know how to measure it. Like, are you saying, give me a what's the simple way for somebody to measure their production or what their their performance through a day? Let's just take an entrepreneur who's simply got a you know, maybe they're building something online that they're going to be launching. How do they, what, do they need benchmarks? Do they need goals that they, that are weekly goals, daily goals? What are they doing? Right. It depends on the project. Of course, shorter project, right. smaller, smaller benchmarks to get us to where we need to go. Pit stop. We need to be done in 10, 11, 12 seconds. Tons of stuff happens during that time. Yeah. However, what we need to look at is what numbers matter. What okay. moves the needle? So if we're planning a long-term project three months out, we can't wait to check in for, you know, feedback sessions. Where are we at? So you look at it and say, what are the measure? What are the most important things? They're going to actually, the drivers are going to actually help us to get things done. And then you begin to mark them out. And, and when you look at that as an entrepreneur, I go back to the basics with, with, with my, with my clients is like, do you know your numbers? Do you know net income, cost to acquire, uh, closing yeah. rates, yeah. all of those things are all measurable that sometimes we just, you know, I say it this way, we, 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 we market, we sell, we execute, we spend. And if there's enough money in the bank to spend, we start it all over again, but there's no really plan to say, how do we market better? How, how do we execute this? How do we sell better? And then, you know, what? how do we take our finances? So I think it's a matter of for us, we had checklists, processes, systems. So when you're talking about execution, okay. you have to say, where am I at? Where do I want to go? Who's going to get me there? And how can I get there? And what are the things that they can bring to the table and their strong points? Because this is where, right, it comes back to roles and responsibilities. So who's responsible for this? This one person is, and how do we hold them accountable to get this done? With, with metrics that they can agree on, yeah? Yeah, and I think there has to be this agreed metric language. Like, hey, I need this report five o'clock Fridays, right? Not okay. 501. Yeah. Like, and for me in our business, right, we say it this way 15 minutes early is on time, on time is late. Yeah. So we like to work ahead. And, and again, so that's a metric, it, though. That's a but metric. That is a metric. Yeah, that's a measurement. It's immeasurable. Mm -hmm. I, I think we live as entrepreneurs sometimes in the creative part, but we don't put things down on paper and say, what are hard numbers? And really math is the path. And it's the yeah. numbers, whether it's a number of reports or the time that it needs to be in or the sequence or the actual flow of work. Like we have to take the time to write those out to say, what is the end goal work backwards and say, okay, if we do this by this, this by this, okay, then we're going to get here. Yeah. And I think entrepreneurs, we just don't do that enough. Where does, where does it, um, you know, obviously you're doing a lot of, the second part of your framework is culture. Um, coming, coming from NASCAR as a pit crew coach, how important was culture there? And how did that give you insight to be able to help organizations now, or even, smaller businesses kind of shape a culture that they just, they just maybe think, put it by the wayside that that's secondary. And you put such an importance of it that it's the number two thing in your, your framework. Yeah. Culture, like I said, is your corporate, is your company horsepower. Was there a and, culture within the NASCAR teams? Yes. Every team. Yeah. So listen, culture happens by design or it happens by default. Think okay. Yeah. It. It's going to happen any, no matter what you're saying. It's going to happen in a vacuum. You're going to have gonna, a culture. It's going to happen with, yeah. So you can say you don't have a culture, but you do have a culture. You just didn't design the culture. Mm. And what I spend a ton of time with my clients on is really cool. unpacking their core values because I define culture as the personality of your company, right? The interface. So if we personify our companies, Culture is how we personify our company, the interactions, the communications, the inclusions, all the things that are important to our company, right? What we want the outward uh, personality to be. The core values are the DNA that drives that person, almost like the mitochondria. Like if you don't have core values, how do you know what's important in the company? 
execution, excellence, integrity, um, creativity, innovation. Once you have those and you have that framework of like, hey, these are ours. I did, I did a great one the other day with one of my clients. And uh, I'm sure he won't mind me sharing it, but their core value acronym ended up being Epic Fun. Yeah, I like it. Epic Fun. So, and I talk about that being marketable and being consumable. So they're able to take that. And and it's measurable. It's very (laughs) measurable. Are you being epic? Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So to me, culture changes everything, right? And it's what helps in recruiting. It it helps in retention. It helps in connecting with our vendors. It helps building relationships. When we have this common culture, it's, it's, it's a common language, a common feel. It's like, think about this. I, I think about my grandmother's house. My grandmother's house had a culture, had a feel to it. Yeah. And our companies can have that. Like, ooh, I smell the bacon and the biscuits and the gravy or the rice pudding. I'm actually going there right yeah. now in my yeah. mind, right? And she's yeah. been gone so many years. But that was part of it. And I think our companies can have that. And Joe, I really feel like a lot of times, and I had this conversation earlier today with a client. I said, what's your core values? And they they started to look at their wall. And I'm like, if you have to look at your wall to understand <laughs> your core values, you don't have core values. Yeah. Right. And we just use them corporately. Like, yes, we have core values, but we don't live them within the company. Yeah. Um, the mindset for somebody to drive a NASCAR race car is as is a peak performance right yeah so as a now you know you got exposed to that as a pit crew uh, as a pit crew coach and being surrounding yourself with these drivers that were performing at the top level of their game championship drivers for nascar elite athletes too and so my you know to to, to keep your mindset sharp i know you allude and in looking through some of your materials and on your website and um, kind of just digging into your background a little bit, that mindset's more than just thoughts. It's also how you, how you're tracking your health and everything else. So talk to us a little bit about, and and I know you're a CrossFit guy. So t- talk to us a little bit about what you mean by mindset and what people can do to sharpen their mindset for success. Yeah. So when I talk about mindset, I talk about voices, choices, and habits, right? So what are the voices in our heads? Yeah. What are we listening to? Is okay. it that self-limiting belief? And time out right here. The greatest <laughs> of the great face self-doubt occasionally. What they do better than most other people is entertain it for a split second and dismiss it, right? What are they what do they talk about? The gap between stimulus and response? Yeah. Like their response and that gap is so tight. Negative thought, nope, gone. I am a champion, right? Yep. And I deserve this. So we talk about the voices. What what, what self limiting beliefs am I living li, li, uh, listening to? Right. Then the choices. I have a choice. Right. Carol Dweck wrote the book. Like she is the mainstay. Right. Yeah. Mindset. Uh, mindset. Right. Yeah. Fixed or growth. If I have a growth mindset, that means I can overcome. If my mindset is fixed, then I'm a victim. And yeah. then we talk about the habits. What habits am I going to incorporate into my daily, weekly life to say? To make me better. And this is how I, for us as pit crew guys, we got confidence, right, by consistency. So we would go out and start with the small things, build the small habits, consistent habit, consistent, consistent, consistent. Put that into the race day, right? Okay, we did it there. We we won. We, we, we did this. It bolsters the confidence, but that confidence comes from the consistency of doing the small things and just stacking that day after day after day. My son is about to start college at High Point University in North Carolina. My neck of the woods. Yeah. And we were down there uh, for when we were first visiting on their walls, like like a, like a mural on the wall was the growth mindset mantra from that book, Mindset. Right. And they preach, you know, having a growth mindset throughout the university. And and uh, so I love that reference. What other, what other um, mindset resources would you recommend for somebody who's struggling right now? Somebody who may have, you know, maybe not severe mental health challenges, but they're having struggles. Maybe the work's not, you know, is going as well, or their company's not growing as fast as they thought it would. Maybe they're 
a small business owner who's just still kind of struggling to get lift off. And uh, you were going to give them some advice or insight into, uh, you know, thinking positive or improving their mindset. Where would you point them? I, I would say start inward. Okay. In other words, start oh. with your, yeah, start with yourself. Do I believe in myself? And that's why I start with voices. Yeah. What voices am I listening to? Am I listening to my mother who was really mean to me or just, you know, talk down to me or my dad who was like, you're never going to be anything. Or maybe the coach that told me one day, you're never going to amount to anything. No, like I have to make the decision to take control of my own life, my own thought life and say, no, the voices that I'm going to listen to are my own. I believe in my own identity. Who am I? And I think you have to do the deep work of like, hey, accepting your journey. And, and listen, I went through this myself, Joe, like really trying to accept. And I'll tell you for a while, I'll be very transparent with you. There were times I was like, you know, are people going to resonate with this NASCAR thing? Is it a little bit too country, a little bit too redneck? And then the more people I shared <laughs> with and Fortune 500 people and folks who sold their businesses um, to Richard Branson and just super, super high powerful people are like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, what are you thinking? Why aren't you leveraging this to the max? And I'm like, okay, great. I had to check my mindset, but embrace our journey. Yeah. Discover who we are and love our identity and begin to really appreciate our journey and our experiences for who we are, because I'm not Joe. I don't have Joe's experience. Joe doesn't have my experience, right? right we're different. We are very different, but we yeah. can learn from each other. And then, you know, kind of pivoting away from that is, Start listening to people who have a great mindset and who talk about mindset. Tom Billyu, I love listening to him, right? Yeah. Guy, guys like yourself, uh, other podcasts that really lift people up and put you in that state of mind. And, and listen, I'm going to say this. In dealing with some high performers, uh, I had a high performer, high performing golf coach, uh, a, a golf client not too long ago. And, you know, we, we, we talked about different things, but one of the things that Trevor Moad wrote in his book about having a neutral mindset, I'm not a big believer in like, let's not make believe it didn't happen. Right. Let's accept where we are. If you, if you slice it into the woods, it's in the woods. Now it becomes an opportunity. How do I get up and down from in the woods as opposed to, oh, I'm in the woods. Right. I'm going to have a bad score. Yeah, I love it. I recently uh, also read a book called uh, The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. And he spends the first couple of chapters about the voices in our head, talking a little bit about um, what we, you know, the conversations we have with ourselves. Yeah, you know, I, I remember being in my early 20s and I read like Sham, Shad Helmsetter's book, What to Say When You Talk to Yourself. And that had a profound impact because no one ever really pointed out how much I talked to myself, number one. Number two, we don't think consciously about how often that dialogue is occurring and what our responses are to it. And so taking conscious control over that, number one, and then number two, you're saying get on a steady diet of positive information. Probably Absolutely. includes, my guess is you don't watch a lot of news or you don't spend a lot of time in front of the television watching news, at least. I, I um, can't entertain the negativity because, again, yeah. I, I geek up over the brain. I, I, I honestly, if yep. I had to do over... I'd probably be a neuroscientist. Yeah. Maybe not practicing, but I love neuroscience. But our brains are wired for negativity. And it's like rewiring the neural pathways and really putting the things in that that give us positivity. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Joe, but you started no. talking about the brain. But yeah, I, I love, love and the, the thing is, we can do that. The science has proven that there's neuroplasticity in our brain. And like you said, you know, the, the, the voices in our head and we have tens of thousands of thoughts every day. Right. I control my thoughts. And when I'm when I'm speaking or working with my clients, I'm like, OK, pink elephant, purple unicorn. Those things pop into your head. How long you let them stay there is up to you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I I learned uh, a long time ago. I think it was from Wayne Dyer about, you know, making sure that before you go to bed, the last piece of information you put in your head is something positive. So I try really hard not to be on my device at the end of the at the end of the night because so much social media can be negative. Um, I deliberately try to read something, even if it's a part of a chapter. It doesn't even have to be a whole chapter of a book. Something that I can read that that's the last thing that went into my mind before right. I hit the pillow. Uh, it's because if I'm going to go to sleep thinking about something, I don't want it to be about something negative that I either just watched or something I just read online. And uh, that's been something I've practiced for years that's really helped me, I think. 
And I, I really encourage people to think about what they're putting in their in their mind the last hour of their night. I love that. And I think mm -hmm. if we look at the mind as a garden, what you plant in it yeah. will grow. Yeah. You want healthy plants or you want weeds? And then what yeah. are you doing during the day to fertilize that garden? And then before you go to bed, how do we put that little extra fertilizer on there? Yeah, love it. <laughs> Speaking of garden, my my mother-in-law has pretty much been helping us with a little garden out back right now. And it's been a lot of fun to watch my my children <laughs> work with that. And uh, they, you know, they're expecting everything, the fruits from the garden to come out much quicker. And just yesterday, my daughter says, well, this is really this is taking a while. And I said, it's been like two weeks. You're not going to start seeing, you know, the fruits of the labor yet, but it'll come. But it's been a great, it's been a great, uh, it's a parallel to, to mindset. hundred uh, percent. Yeah. You know, Hey, they got a couple more people on there. There's Ken Wall saying, Hey, I'll make sure you guys get introduced. Uh, Matt, I was just in Charlotte not long ago in February and I was across the street from the NASCAR hall of fame. Yep. St staying at the NBC suites there. I didn't get a chance to go in and see it but I've always had a lot of admiration for NASCAR. I don't think anyone understands that 70 second work week like you do for the, for the pit crews that work so hard to make sure those drivers are supported. But as a pit crew coach, right? How po what possibly can you give, give them? What can you share with them that's gonna help them stay focused and in the zone in those 70 seconds? Because I think that advice can also pertain to the question I asked earlier, which is how do we stay in the zone during our workday aside from just turning off distractions? So if we look at the 70 second work week, that's broken over four or five, six segments, right? So there's dedicated yeah. segments. So there's segments of work. So let's look yeah. at one pit stop as a segment, right? Yeah. So for us, we'll do the pit stop. What is the call? So we know what the goal is for the pit stop. Hey, we're going to change four tires. We're going to put fuel in it. We're going to change two tires. We're going to adjust on the car, whatever that thing is. So we have a goal for the pit stop. We have a plan for the pit stop. What's everybody's choreograph, right? And then we have an execution like we do it. Then we come back and we review it because we, we, we videotape it. That's where we can break down the sessions. And in real time, yeah. right? So in real time, that's how I did it, Joe. I would coach my guys and say, hey, listen. Maybe a couple extra steps here, or you jumped off the wall a little bit late, or your gun angle was a little bit off, right? Where were you, where was your mind? Because I work with these guys all the time, so I know the talent is there. So a lot yeah. of times, number one, it's knowing how to coach your athletes. Some athletes need a smack on the tail. Some athletes just need a good chewing. Some athletes just need to be left alone for a little bit. So knowing your personnel, this is on the people side. Yeah, great. But we did the review. And then we would say, okay, what are we going to do? That pit stop's over, right? Now let's go to the next pit stop. So during the day, what project am I working on? Have a plan. Like I tell my clients this, do a brain dump. Because the mind needs bandwidth for creativity. A lot of my clients are just like, I got all this. And I'm like, well, where's your list? Like, ah. So I make them do just a major brain dump. And then we'll break it down into categories. And then I'll say, listen, if you're like me, now some people can live by the minute on their calendar, full transparency. I can't do that. No. I need a menu. So yeah. I have a list of things that I want to work on. So maybe today I want to work on writing my copy or updating my website, right? Or yeah. in this case, I got some great tips on your podcast invite page. Great page, by the way, Joe, right? So Thank you. I'm going to hit my stuff up with that. Yeah. But I want to have the flexibility to do that. So we have to have a plan when it comes to executing our day. Yeah. And I, you also hit on something I think that everyone could, could uh, take for, take and, and apply it in their business, which is the review part of what you did as a pit crew coach. Uh, how often do we go through our days, our weeks, and we don't really have, and this is something that I got from Brendan Bouchard's uh, High Performance Planner that it has a weekly review like let's look look back at your week and review what you got done what you did do what you didn't do um before you plan forward and and that review part of what you did with the crew and i know you went through that really quickly that played an instrumental part in improvement right we can't improve something that we didn't review right Just like we can't measure something right uh we're not gonna we're not gonna improve on something if we don't measure it but I think we also have to be able to review it. And so that review piece, I think, is really an important insight. Absolutely. So we do it actually twice. And we may look at the same pit stop multiple times. So we do it at the track in real time. Yeah. There are some things that we can correct in real time. So in real time, 
put the phone down. That's like a real time correction. Like stop yeah. scrolling real time correction. Mindset issues may be a little bit longer. So we look at it in real time at the track. Yeah. Then we go back to the shop and that's where as a coach, I would break down, look at every, every video, 25 segments, break it down, then say, where do we need to improve? What is the practice plan? Then we look at it again as a team, we come together where we're not in the competitive environment, sit down in the video review and say, Hey, listen, let's look at this. Hey, you did this, Matt, you did this, Joe, you did this, Bill, let's work on this. How can we make this better? Okay. Here's the drill work now moving yeah. forward. So we just don't blanket like, Hey, we're just going to just show up with no plan. No, like we had a plan because for us, the next week may be at a different track. So the car is set up differently, yeah. right? Because we have short tracks, big tracks. Those are all different circumstances. And that's what happens in our business. This week was like super slow. The, the funnel wasn't full. This week, it's crazy. How do we adjust in real time, review what's going on, what we did last week, make a plan and adjust so we can win for this week? You know, I also like, you know, you, you referred to this great stuff, by the way, I, I didn't want to lose this thought. You referred to the, the pit crew as athletes too, right? I get, and, I get go ahead. Jeff, no, no, so here's what, here's what, and you treat them like that in how you're coaching them. But the, you know, there's obviously there's, they have to be physically up for the challenge of what 70 seconds means to their life and career. Okay. And so, you know, when you're reviewing, and some, and it's, it's mindset, but there might be something that's affecting it back home, or maybe it was a change of diet or something that just, they, they say, man, I didn't feel that great that day. Or, Hey, when, you know, I just, I've been, I've been kind of under the weather. <clears throat> you might be able to pinpoint things. Uh, how does, does food, does exercise play a part in that mindset part of peak performance? Yes. So I'm a holistic coach. I believe all areas of our life impact our performance. Okay. With that said, pit crew athletes. The sport has evolved from J Joe, the mechanic. Okay. This is where we get to call the average Joe, right? The Joe, yeah. the mechanic, right? Yeah. Or Matt, the mechanic right. has evolved to where you're highly specialized, right? As a pit crew athlete. So we began recruiting folks from the college scenes and pro scenes to come in and be athletes. I grew up as a, as a college coach, as an athlete. So that's how I viewed life. Like I like to coach that way, but I'm also a relational coach. Right. So we talk about styles. So I think knowing your athletes, how to coach them and then saying, hey, what's different? And it may be like, hey, you know what? At being a relational coach, like how's things, man? Is it a mindset thing? Is it a yeah. confidence thing? Then maybe I find out if I dig a little deeper and I have that relationship. It's like, man, things aren't good at home. <laughs> OK, what's happening? All right. Let's let's figure that out. Again, we make these guys work out while they're at the shop. Right. They have to work out. Part of them being, you know, paid hundreds of thousands of dollars is they have to work out body, body comp measurements like yeah. fitness tests. We do all of that. So it's full blown, fully. For the pit crew. Yeah. For the pit crew. These are professional yeah. athletes. Yeah. That's what everybody understand. Not just for the drivers here. Right. For the pit crew. For the pit crew. These these are professional yeah. athletes and that's how we treat them. So if I'm going to chew you and listen, I've smashed some stopwatches. Yeah. I've blown my stack as a coach. Like, let's get our crap together. Like yeah. at practice sessions, like shaking a fence. I mean, you know, I've done that because these are athletes that get it because they've been in those high performance situations prior to coming to NASCAR. Yeah, great stuff. And, you know, I, I, I think that there's a lesson in that as well, an underlying lesson that we should treat ourselves like athletes that need to be performing at a high level in order to do that. It's the same, the same mindset applies. Absolutely. And I think uh, we all I mean, a lot of times entrepreneurs don't think of themselves like that, like that they are this. They also have to be a kind of a well oiled machine, you know, fitness and and health. I know I'm guilty of this. I fall in that trap many times and and uh, kind of feel like I'm in that trap right now. But that also all plays into high performance. Uh, it all impacts yeah. how we perform and how we show up yeah. now we can get away with it at varying degrees. Right. Yeah. So I, I right. CrossFit. So maybe I don't need to have like 5% body fat, like for me to be a good coach or an entrepreneur. <laughs> right. But I will tell you this, Joe, if you're not getting good sleep, if you're not eating well, it all impacts yeah. brain function. Yeah. Which impacts our ability to be cognitive, to be creative, which, yeah, which will impact, impact the coaching <laughs> will impact coaching, will impact culture, will impact yeah. execution. Right. So yeah. 
I really believe if, if, if as CEOs, C-suite, high level business leaders and experts, if they take on the mindset, like I'm a high performer, they would live their lives different. They would not like this, right? They wouldn't want their athletes out at 12, one, two, three o'clock in the morning, trying to show up and do a presentation, you know, for a $10 million contract the next morning. That's right. It does happen, <laughs> but are, right. are they at their best? That's not their preference. Debatable. Great stuff, Matt. And this has been, this has been awesome. Lots of great insight coming out of this uh, short discussion. And I know we're, we're new friends. I'm looking forward to being longtime friends. Absolutely. This has been awesome. Everyone, hopefully you've had a chance to visit mattclarkmc.com. And I'll make sure the link is in the show notes here. Go check out his website. He's got a lot of great resources on there. He's got a blog on there and he also offers coaching. Um, is there anything else? Is there anywhere else that you'd want them to be able to find you? Are you on LinkedIn? Uh, I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm on Insta. Um, I'm in a marketing mastermind that has pushed me to try to do uh, TikTok. <laughs> oh no. TikTok, yes. 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 I, I, I just, I've got to push through, right? That's a mindset thing for me. Yeah. But yeah. They can find me on social and I'm on Twitter. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm easily accessible. Matt is Clark, it okay if you're MC. on it, but you're not as active? uh promoting on it <laughs> for, for tiktok yeah like i'm on tiktok but i'm not really producing content for tiktok right now yeah so we can have a whole nother conversation to me <laughs> tiktok is we should a do a tiktok world. challenge we should do a tiktok challenge we should we i mean with, with, with some of your listeners like and again i've been in a, like the mastermind i'm in they're like hey let's do a, you know you got to post three times uh you know ken ken walls he has 100 videos on tiktok i think i've got show four, off and <laughs> right. But yeah, I mean, we could do a TikTok challenge, Joe. I mean, I, I'm down with it. Again, it's about just building awareness about what we do and empowering people to win and be champions in life. That's right. Well said. Awesome. Thanks for being my guest today, Matt. Thanks everybody for being here. I'll see you guys next time on the Not Your Average Joe show. Matt Clark, MC.com. Go learn out. Go learn more about him. You're going to see a lot more of Matt in months and years to come. Thanks for being on here, man. Thanks for having me, Joe. See you, everybody. Tune in next week for the Not Your Average Joe Show with international business mentor Joe Soto. 